Hi, everyone. This is Jason Burek of Wall Street for Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Main Street podcast interview. Each year, he has released an annual report for over a decade. I was one of the first people to interview him besides Dr. Chris Martinson. His annual report talks about all the events, geopolitical markets each year. I think he spends many, many hours over the course of a couple months writing this out and in a preview for the next year coming forward. He is a chemistry professor, but He's more well-known now for his Twitter rants and also his annual report that's coming out in the financial Twitter space. David Colm, thank you for joining me again. Uh, uh, Glad to join you. We've done this for many years now. We have. And uh, I remember hearing you and Dr. Chris Martinson and reaching out to you. And I think I was one of the first podcasters to reach out to you for interviews back then. I mean, you've done so many more interviews over the course and then I remember seeing you before your Twitter became enormous, how you would go on Capital Count. You would fly in what to DC here and you'd go on with Dimitri Kofinas and Lauren Lister on Capital Count on RT. That was a really good financial financial show back in the day. Yeah, I, I missed that show, actually. When she went to Yahoo, it might have been a plus for her, but, but she disappeared completely from my radar. And I used to love Capital Account. So, and I, that was... Uh, it was the first time I was on RT, and I actually talked to our media guys and asked them, you know, first of all, I'd never done live TV. So I actually uh, actually went over to the media and just had them do a quick check to make sure I wasn't idiosyncratic, which I knew I was. But um, And then they pointed out that RT had some like 350 million setup boxes. And so my the first interview I did with Lauren, my colleague, sat around taking shots every time I said the word fed. <laughs> so it, it, it was I, I enjoyed those trips to dc but but uh those are the olden days well it was a network actually that didn't want to keep those two around because i'm i'm friends with dimitri kofinas and i mean he eventually i think he took a break from finance and then he restarted it a couple of years later with hit the hidden forces podcast so he's having we well, he also of- had a very big health problem he had a huge he had a brain tumor right Yes, yes. He he's written blog articles about that. It was actually pretty miraculous how him and his dad read through all this medical research and found a doctor willing to do an experimental brain surgery on him. Right. He was in fact I found out that when I was down there talking to him on one of my interviews that uh he said, "Yeah, at that point in time I was hanging on to reality by by the thinnest of threads and i'm going oh that's interesting i i didn't detect that you know he wasn't swinging at dragons flying by or anything like that but he he was really struggling well chadwick boseman the actor the academy award-winning actor Mm -hmm. who was what uh in wakanda the black panther movies i mean he hid his cancer too so there's it just happens people are if you're mentally tough i guess you can hide it for a little while uh, Dimitri, right. Dimitri's doing great work though over at. Uh, I think Force. Dimitri's one of the very best. Yeah. Yep, he's a top five interviewer, just like me. He does a lot of background research for uh, a lot of his interviews. So, David, I want to ask you about 2022. Some of the key things that happened now. Your report for 2022 is talked all about Ukraine. So, you would say it was more about geopolitical, and then the knock-on effects of all the sanctions that were put on Ukraine with energy and fertilizer and things like that, that led to higher inflation? Well, you know, I I would say that the Ukraine story um, triggered inflation that was deeply embedded in the DNA of our system. And it it just required a spark. And I would say that that the, that the Ukraine slash energy slash COVID lockdown problem was the spark. So I, I don't think it's as much causal as people believe. I think I think I think inflation was just waiting to rip out of the gates, and and as soon as they gave it a reason, it went. And it wasn't it was it was certainly accelerated by the Fed's go direct policy that started in fall of two, 2019, actually before COVID, where they were jamming money into the system in new and innovative ways at the behest of uh, BlackRock. Yeah, I would agree. From a money supply standpoint, for two and a half years since the first quarter of 2020 and more bailouts, I mean, there was a ton of bailouts during the 2019 repo madness crisis, too. But all these governments in early 2020, they just printed insane amounts of new currency, mostly for stimmy checks, mostly for bailouts for large corporations, and then also to buy government bonds. And that money supply growth 
was while they were shutting the economy down. So the economy was not producing lots of supply of lo- of goods and services. And we still have supply chain problems now when we're recording this interview on January 7th, Tuesday, January 17th, 2023. I mean, we, I just see new supply chain problems every day, whether it's Arizona iced tea company, their plastic bottles. I think they said their plastic bottle costs are up 25% compared to aluminum cans. And then the egg crisis that's, that's happening right now. Tell me about the egg crisis. Cause I'm picking it up, but I'm not picking up the story. What's going on with the egg crisis? Well, apparently about 10% of the chicken population died for some type of bird flu, but I mean, a lot they, of it died or they killed it. <laughs> Who knows the truth at this point? <laughs> well, no, 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 but they could have had one of these. You've got an infected flock and therefore you have to, you have to sacrifice them all. Well, I mean, costs were already going up. If you speak to farmers, right. though, um, I've been interviewing Doomberg now for over a year, every couple months. And I was getting feedback from farmers all over the United States and also in Brazil and South America, hearing some of their stories. And they were just telling me all their input costs were going up. They had to because fertilizer prices were up so much at one point. And a lot of that was because of not just Russia or Ukraine, but these other countries then responded to with fertilizer export bans. So they decided because fertilizer prices were up because natural gas prices outside of the United States were up so much that they were going to skip ordering fertilizer, which means they were going to not order planting. So if you don't have as much staple crops, that means you the feed for a lot of these animals is going to go up. We're just seeing this at the grocery store now, David, with shrinkflation, the consumer price index, which is still relatively high, although now like the PhD economists and the deflationistas are saying it's falling, inflation has peaked, it's over. I mean, like the reality for most people at the grocery store or the restaurant, their cost per unit, they're dealing with bad stagflation and shrinkflation and their cost of living is getting um, their cost of living is getting destroyed. A standard of living the, is getting destroyed. The, these guys who are pronouncing inflation is over the same clowns, however, who will say markets never go straight up, nor does inflation. And so, well, it can eventually it can go completely straight up and go completely vertical. But the point is the inflation could pull back to forget. Let's just pretend like the CPI is a valid number. It's not. But but it it, it reflects a valid number somewhere out there. Um CPI could flutter a little along the way and still get to very high levels, just like in the seventies, right? When Volcker was battling it, um, it, it 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 didn't go straight up. It just it just kind of moved around, and there were months where it kind of fluttered back down, and then it would take off again. So, um, by no means can anyone pronounce the inflation problems over. They can guess, they can they can predict, but they don't know. Well, I would say it's confirmation bias because a lot of the people that saying inflation has peaked were the ones that were every week or two in 2020 and 2021 were calling tops on inflation. They were saying there wasn't going to be any inflation because there's no velocity of money. Meanwhile, the governments were printing many trillions and handing out stimmy checks while they were shutting down the economy and there was less supplies and all these less supply of goods and services uh, moving throughout the economy. And then they were, uh, there was all these supply chain problems. Now, I think the next shoe to drop, David, is because lots of people are researching inflation. The Google searches for inflation are up. Lots of people are aware of it for the first time in decades. I would say where some of them in their entire lifetime, they're actually looking up inflation. You're starting to see a lot of workers in different industries all over the globe. They want higher wages. So I don't think the consumer price index is accounting for these wage increases that are going to be coming. And that's going to hurt profit margins for businesses. Consumers are going to get hurt. Um, the higher wages will somewhat offset inflation, but not fully. Well, the consumer price index is also stupidly twisted thing. So I, I put out a tweet one day, which my brother, who's an accountant and keeps track of everything way more than me, he it was the middle of last year, and he said that on his most recent bean count year over year, his food costs were up forty one percent. It's a sterile tweet. I didn't have any more insight than that. It got something like. 30,000 likes, you know, Twitter, that's a, that's a viral tweet right there. And, and, um, Jimmy Iorio jumped in and said his restaurant, he, he, I think it was 25 to 26% input costs for his restaurant. And another accountant jumped in and said he, he did the same thing. My brother didn't got exactly the same number. So 
Um, the other thing is, is what I like to ask people rhetorically, if you are going to, if you're a contractor and you're going to build a house two years from now, someone said, I need a house built in 20, 2025. Um, how much would you add to your estimate to cover potential inflation in labor and materials? And the answer is a very big number if you actually ask a contractor that question. So the inflation is in the DNA. It's that's why inflation expectations is so important because it, it now has been wired into, into the system. So we already have an inflation problem for 2024 20, and 25 because it's being wired into the estimates. Yeah. And the consumer price index has something called the base effects, which is a deflator. So if the inflation is not going up 8% per year, the base effects catches up to this and says that, well, just because there's a higher cost structure in the economy for all these businesses, the consumer's getting shrinkflated, that means there's not as much inflation, even though the reality for consumers and businesses, like you just said, is a much higher cost structure. The changing propaganda index, or CPLI as I call it, is meant to hide this with the base effects and the deflator because the inflation rate is not increasing. So therefore, they say inflation has gone away. <laughs> Even though the cost right. structure, the new normal is much higher costs, much higher labor costs, uh, shrinkflation for the consumer at the grocery store and at the restaurant. Well, there's also shitflation where you buy a good that doesn't cost any more, but it it has a, twice the depreciation rate. So, so if oh, you yes. looked at if you looked at an appliance you bought when we were when I was a kid, they lasted for years, and and you look at an appliance now, and they they don't. So whatever the the if you if you look at cost per use um inflation's run rampant and the cpi doesn't pick up on this at all oh i totally agree if you speak to some of these consumer products companies say like a vacuum cleaner company or others mm -hmm. they'll tell you that they changed their business model so they intentionally uh cut the cost of manufacturing they outsourced it to china and the goal was to have more defective products. So instead of making a product that would last for 10, 15, 20 years or more, like what you said used to happen in the past, instead the business model was to outsource manufacturing to China and then the products would break down every couple of years. And the business model was the customer would have to keep ordering new, new pro uh, more and more of the same product. <laughs> right, right. So that's the world we, we're in and we've got a. We've got an entire generation, several generations who are unfamiliar with inflation, which do you remember on Twitter two or three years ago, you would see tweets by people who say, you know, I'd really love inflation because then it would decrease, you know, the cost of my debt, you know, my mortgage, whatever. Uh, to which point at this time, I now ask, how's that mortgage payment? Has it really gotten easier to pay? And, and while you're trying to pay it, have the costs surrounding the mortgage, your, the cost of living, the cost of maintenance, the cost of the taxes on the house, have, have those in any way made it easier? And the answer is no. So what a lot of people didn't realize is, is that when inflation, in theory, inflates away death, debt, you pay dearly. You pay dearly. Oh, yeah. Everyone's cost, cost structure is up. Their standard of living is getting diminished unless they're growing their income. But if you look at, it depends on the inflation rate. So if you look at like Zimbabwe, Argentina, Venezuela, while the inflation rate was lower, people were able to hustle and figure out side jobs and grow their incomes to somewhat offset the inflation. As the inflation rate increased, it became impossible to figure out all these jobs to grow your income to offset the inflation rate. So we're not we're not at Zimbabwe levels or Argentina or Venezuela levels of of really bad stagflation or hyperinflation yet. But if this continues, um, I think we're we're headed along that path. Um, really, so the stagflation we have now is very bad, though. Uh, you brought up a good point, though, about inflation and interest rates. So we have the Fed. They're trying to kill demand because they can't fix the supply problems by raising interest rates. Do you think that the higher interest rates have affected the entire economy yet? Because, I mean, they're still raising interest rates. Do you think that that has affected um, more than just bonds and real estate yet? Yeah, I think it's affected everything. I mean, I, but, but, but here's the problem. Um, <clears throat> you got the nitwits who 
who use um, uh, who who use uh, the the interest rates as a metric to justify market valuations. So you say, well, markets are fair valued because uh, let's go back a year or two because the ten year rates two percent, and therefore the the markets are fair value comparing it to to the to the treasury rates. And and it's a stupid bit of logic, which I don't know if they're lying or if they're just dumb, but um, they're they're justifying their market valuation, their equity valuations, using the biggest credit bubble in history. And so, if you're going to use that metric, then sure things can look cheap. But that's like comparing a hundred thousand dollar Toyota Camry to a hundred thousand dollar Accord. It, it's a stupid comparison. Um, so now, now let's accept that though. I say, okay, okay, let's give that to them. They get to do that. Well, now the rates have more than doubled. Therefore, equity valuation should have cut in half. How's that working out for you? So they have not cut in half. So that model is obviously garbage. But the other interesting thing is that, um, is that, uh, we've only given back froth of the last 18 months. So, so the twenty the twenty twenty two froth skim was only twenty two months of a twenty uh, eighteen months of appreciation. So, if you really think that's a secular bear market, have a ball. But secular bear markets take back vast amounts of gains when they show up. And so, we haven't we haven't even started. That was what I'd call maybe phase one. You know, if you want to divide a game into nine innings, I'll, I'll give you I'll give you inning two or three. Um, there will not be, um, there will not, you won't even begin to be able to call for some bottom until people are just screaming in pain. And my base model right now is that, um, because we're boxed in by inflation and the fed is therefore cornered, they can't print their way out of this without, without completely abrogating their responsibility. Uh, my base model is a generational secular bear market. I would argue that the inflation, uh, excuse me, I would argue that the interest rate hikes have not affected everything yet because we haven't had a real estate crash. So we've had um, home prices and home sales slow down because of mortgage. There's uh, because of higher costs of mortgage for a potential new buyer. So there are a lot less buyers unless you're an all cash buyer. But I don't think we've had anywhere close to a real estate crash. Now we have like oh, not at all. I I, I misjudged. I mis sort of heard your question. So not at all. Uh, real estate pricing by the sellers is very sticky, right? So people people take a while to let go of their notion of how valuable their house is when they go to sell it. Well, also and, you have a lot of people that locked in a lower mortgage at a much lower interest rate. And so they're hesitant to sell the house now while home prices are falling because then they'd have, if they go and get another house, they'd have to get a mortgage right. at a much higher interest rate. So it doesn't make a lot of sense then until maybe the Fed goes back towards, uh, starts lowering rates again and head towards uh, zero interest rate policy. I don't think they can do it. Well, I, I think, think they're I finally think that, cornered. I think 40 years of dropping rates is over. I don't think the Fed can do it. The Fed has had this luxury of being able to drop Fed funds rate from extraordinary numbers in 1980, 81, down to zero. Those days are done. We've just squeezed the last drop out of that citrus fruit. It's gone. So I think so the I, Fed. I think the Fed is trapped. I think we just disagree then on on how badly trapped or what options the Fed has left. Because I'm looking at the interest payments on the debt for the U.S. Treasury, and can the U.S. Treasury, with the national debt headed towards 32 trillion very quickly, can the U.S. Treasury actually afford five percent or six percent rates without the Fed buying, expanding their balance sheet, and buying even more U.S. Treasuries? Well, when push comes to shove, will the Fed accept? Horrific debasement of the currency or, or horrific problems in the bond and equity market? Which will they choose? I think they're the buyer of last resort of U.S. Treasury. So um, you might be right. They might have to choose between making sure they fund the U.S. Treasury and not supporting the stock market or real estate. So I think they will choose U.S. Treasuries first. That's the priority. So they're throwing, they're throwing themselves under the bus. The Fed is throwing itself under the bus. 
Well, the other part of this equation, Dave, is how much more reliant all levels of government now have become on this asset price inflation, thanks to the Cantillon effect and zero interest rate policy for almost 15 years, for around 15 years, because of all the extra capital gains taxes, property taxes that were coming from inflated stock prices, inflated bond prices, inflated real estate prices, all these levels of government were just collecting extra tax receipts. So if those go away, then the government budgets, I don't know a lot of government levels of government that are really efficient at cutting their budgets quickly. So I think there's going to be a mess. The Fed might have to start buying municipal bonds too for bill. So will the Fed let inflation get to 25%? I don't know if they're going to be uh, anything close to honest about this. I mean, David, according to shadow stats, what the sh- the shadow stats- it's Already near 20, right? Yeah, it well, it peaked temporarily at what around 18 and it's come down a little bit. So what 16 right. now? <laughs> so 16 right. is still really bad stagflation. <laughs> right. And 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 the problem is we're just starting. So the question is at some point the Fed's going to face so- Sophie's choice. Are they going to destroy their legacy, their credibility and the currency? Or are they going to destroy the equity and bond markets? Well, David, it seems all these governments have done similar policies because they were all kind of copying what Japan was doing. And Japan has hit the wall first. And then you have these larger countries like China, Germany, Japan that used to run trade surpluses and then buy those U.S. treasuries. And that would subsidize our debt so the Fed wouldn't have to buy everything. Seems that those days are over, too. Right. But we're coming... What what you're describing here, by the way, is stage four cancer. You're describing a situation where the person has cancer. I use this metaphor almost every podcast. And the the person with the stage four cancer says, what do we do? And the doctor says, well, you get your affairs in order. You're done. The question is, in what way are you going to go? Because I don't see either solution as anything but catastrophe. Yeah, I agree. I see government debt crises in Japan, in the United Kingdom, in the European Union. I see China with an enormous credit bubble and a real estate bus and a tech bus. And then I see the U.S. It looks like the U.S. is being saved for last because on a relative basis, because all these fiat currencies suck, the dollar is the strongest relative to these other fiat currencies. And the U.S., because of that, the U.S. debt's going to keep growing and that's going to create an even larger problem To use your analogy there, the cancer is just going to metastasize and keep growing. Right. The other problem is the Forex market is not really, the Forex market is a goddamn casino. It's not the value of the dollar. So the dollar is not strong. It's it's strong on a curve relative to other garbage. And so the the dollar is weak. I'll tell you how you know the dollar is weak because it buys less. So the dollar is weak. And if you want to compare it to the euro, have a ball, right? That's that's you're now you're grading on a curve, and you happen to have a classroom of idiots, so it's easy to beat the curve. Um, <laughs> but but the problem here is is that the forex markets, also being a casino, are potentially an emergent system. They're potentially a system that could go chaotic, and I mean really chaotic, like repo, like the repo uh, madness of 2019, where 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 the entire system starts fishtailing on black ice. Well, and the didn't. Fed will the Fed will be powerless. Well, I the think Fed, we had that a couple months ago, right? With the UK pension funds. I mean, there was, in, from what I heard, and I spoke yep. to someone who spoke to people at the Fed here in DC, there was over $600 billion in bailouts for the UK. So they needed a currency swap line from the Fed. Uh, the press release that was issued with the number officially is not the real number. I heard it was over $600 billion in a 48-hour period because of the pension funds that had these hedge fund leveraged hedge fund bets, the insurance companies, reinsurance companies. Uh, hedge funds, banks, all the people that had loaned to the pension funds, and these things were about to blow up because the Bank of England raised interest rates and then the dollar was too strong. Well, do you remember back in 07, though? So the real estate market peaked in 2006, very quietly. After, uh, I think this current real estate bubble is bigger than the last one, but it's not as frothy looking. And it's because you don't, 
you don't have the same retail participation you had back then. Back then, you had all these ninja loans and stuff that were blatantly obvious warning signs. This bubble, I actually think it's a bubble inside the finance system where the very large real estate conglomerates are going to get in trouble. So BlackRock has huge real estate positions that they're going to have to liquidate at some point. That's going to cause a real problem. So, so I think the problem that the Fed will face is that, that the system can't be saved. So it's going, to be, it's going to be a choice of just two really awful things. And when they choose it, it will not look like they chose correctly, no matter what. Because there is no way out. It's, it's you know, you jump off a building. You're, I, well, we need a new system. The problem is the system. The problem is these governments and central banks have too much power and control over our lives and the economy. And then they pick and choose winners and losers. I mean, wasn't BlackRock, BlackRock, you've been around in the financial community for a long time. I mean, BlackRock was given access to all this cheap capital post 2008 to go and buy up entire rows of homes with private equity and hedge funds. And then they were allowed to basically given a zero interest rate loan to buy mortgage backed securities for pennies on the dollar. So they were given all these advantages. The rules were changed. Do you think we're going to see more of that where um, uh, it looks like pension funds are going to be needing bailouts because of their hedge fund trades if real estate and other asset markets do crash soon? Well, so to clarify your BlackRock zero interest rate in case it sounds like a uh, a sweeping statement. Technically, I think their interest rate was 0.15%. And, and so, and so in Close fact, enough. <laughs> no, that's right. But a person listening could be thinking, well, he's rounding down to zero from something like 2%. Yeah, could That's you or me true. have borrowed? It, could you have me have borrowed at, at those to go and buy mortgage-backed securities for a penny on the dollar, or go buy entire streets of houses and uh, rent them out for rental property income? <laughs> borrow so, those rates. So, so the the problem we have now is is that we are now facing inflation, and we weren't facing inflation then. And the problem we have now is that we're facing systemic risk of an unimaginable magnitude, which Volcker, for example, didn't face. When Volcker put the screws on the system to get control of it, our total sovereign debt was something like 31% of GDP. Now, what is it, 150? I don't even remember the number, but it's a gargantuan number relatively. Here's one for you. I just These are little ditties. These are just bullets. Um, and I, I redid the math. I was underestimating the bullet. So here's a fresh new math that turns out if you look at the valuation of the equity markets in 1981, and you look at the valuations at the end of 2021, in those 40 years, um, it turns out of all the gains over those 40 years, 4.5% per year were valuation expansion, which is by definition a mean regressing thing and by definition something that cannot go on forever and so so and if at the end of that 40 year period of 4.5% valuation expansion along with demographic benefits along with cheap commodities along with globalization along with uh, cheap labor from china if your pension funds in trouble you really blew it because that was the 40 best years you're ever going to get. And 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 if you're toast, like Kentucky, what, 20% funded pension fund? I mean, that's they apparently got screwed not because of bad decisions, but rather because of just theft, just straight up criminal activity where the Kentucky pension or pension fund managers just got taken to the cleaners by the crooks on Wall Street. So, so. But I don't think, I don't think this idea that well we'll bail out all the pensions, we'll bail out all the states, we'll bail out all the people. I don't think that model's correct because I think we'll discover that it's not possible without a thermonuclear explosion going off. Anyways, it's not a solution. So the people say, well, we'll do this again. I go, I don't think so. Well, they're they're picking and choosing winners and losers via politics. Well, what they're and... going to be picking is they're going to be picking nothing but losers going forward, in my opinion. I, I, I just I just don't I don't until now we've had options. I do not see options now. 
Yeah, I, I think the Fed has basically trapped themselves because the right. zero interest rate policy lasted way too long. And now government tax receipts, they were flush with cash, but they've been spending more. So as more tax receipts come in, the way government works, they spend more. They don't spend less. They don't build surpluses like a private sector business might. So the Fed has been accused of keeping interest rates way too long. Uh, way too low for way too long by way too many people for way too many years. So so there's just, there was a window from 09 to the present where they could have said, look, the economy is sucking eggs, but we have to normalize. And therefore, we're going to have to let this economy do some more rotting. And they chose not to do it. Well, you remember the comments from Janet Yellen from 2012, 2013 to 2019. she's an idiot, too. I mean, she's just an idiot. Oh, she's corrupt and a liar, and her track record's atrocious. I mean, she's a typical government employee, though. I mean, she fails forward with the, with the Peter principle. <laughs> Actually, right. the worst prediction she has, the more money she gets paid, the more deals she gets offered, because she's behind the scenes politicking and networking to get new deals and get promotions. That's how things work here in D.C. Or it's just the corruption. I have a friend who's now at the Davos level. And I, I can see the addiction to that kind of headiness. So if you're in Davos right now, right, if you're if you're playing that game right now, no matter who you are, you're thinking, I'm hanging out with the cool kids. How do I get invited back next year? And you Get invited back by now rocking the boat. And so, so promoting or in promoting ESG, <laughs> promoting right. energy. And so it's like, a, it's like a journalist who's worried about pissing off their, the people they write about. So they, they write puff pieces. Even if they're not paid to write puff pieces, they're doing it to protect their, their sphere of influence. This is where the cool kids are hanging out. And you, you desperately, as a, as a social, as a social animal, you desperately want to be hanging out with the cool kids. And so it's addictive. It's addictive. You, the power is addictive. Yeah, the new one is ESG. So if you work at a large corporation or a big bank, if you're trying to rise up the ranks there and you don't want to co commit career suicide, you cannot publicly speak out against ESG or as I call energy uh, or as I call it energy spending grift. <laughs> right. It, it's all a grift. The, the climate change grift, you name it. I just watched the John Kerry speech he gave that was the most appalling speech I've heard in a long time, which contrasts with that Kyson guy who gave the most amazing six minute speech on climate change. But you, you can't even criticize that money was wasted on wind, solar, uh, biofuels that it took away from food supply. Uh, for poor people to be able to buy food at a cheaper price, because instead of growing, um, you know, staple crops on arable land, instead they decided to grow biofuels, uh, crops for biofuels on that land instead. So you can't make any valid points because then they say you're a climate change denier. They say all these things about you, and then they could get you blacklisted and get your career ruined. Well, I'm a climate change denier, and I think the climate change story is filled with compulsive liars. So uh, there's that. Um, the the climate change grift is a hundred and fifty trillion dollar grift going forward, and the, the appalling part of it is it is so hard to definitively prove they're full of crap that the whole story is a load of crap, which in my opinion it unambiguously is. But there's a a nonstop wave of people coming out and saying climate change is a crisis, we have to do something. So you're constantly dodging these idiots, these liars. And, and if you dig into it, you will find very famous. You know, you know who really fights the climate deniers the most? The field or the physicists? The physicists. Find me a solar physicist who thinks climate change is a problem. Every last solar physicist will tell you it's the goddamn sun. So this is just a grift. But the problem is it's a grift that we'll be able to keep on giving to the grifters for decades because it takes decades to finally show, look, it didn't actually happen. Almost Decades. all almost all of these other energy technologies too, David, you still need either plastics or enormous amounts of fossil fuels yep. or, or rare earth elements or copper, things that have to be mined that require an enormous amount of energy to pull out of the ground and refine and turn into something actually useful. So 
It's right. Still- so we don't have, for example, we don't have the resources to make electric cars that we say we're going to make. But but here's the funny story. This is well, a, I find well, a funny not, way. Not to- unless we not unless we approved all these copper mines. So yeah, I agree. So no, no, current- no, no. We don't. We don't. Known global reserves of various elements. We do not have the elements. We don't have them. And so, so copper is one of them. There are so many others, cobalt, you know, there's all sorts of elements that we have to amp up by, you know, tenfold, 20 fold. And we don't have it. We don't know where we're going to find it. And so, but here's the funny part. So, so if solar and wind power are so good, so we're buying it all from China, right? It's all being made in China, shipped over there. China, here's the way to think about it. China is making all these solar panels, all these windmills and sending them to us. They're taking the proceeds and buying nuclear power plants. If wind and solar were so goddamn good, why don't they just hang on to their own windmills and, 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 and solar panels? The answer is because it's crappy energy. They yeah, want nukes because they know. It's not cheap electricity either. I mean, Germany's learning that. Germany's had to use an enormous amount of coal and wood for the winter. They had to pay sky-high natural gas prices. I was just talking about this on another podcast for my YouTube channel. I mean, they paid sky-high prices to buy liquefied natural gas that the Chinese resold to them for the winter right. a couple months ago. That they bought that they bought from Russia. Right. So the Russians are they're, they're just laundering Russian energy through China. And then getting a hundred percent markup. Um, yeah, the, the whole. As I look at what's going on in the world, whether it's ESG, climate change, uh, uh, Ukraine, uh, you name it, uh, it it looks like someone is making decisions that are designed to destroy the system. And I'm not saying that metaphorically. Actually, the decisions look like someone is attempting to completely destroy the system. It looks like social engineering and people are just ignoring reality. So ignoring reality that it requires all these materials or cost of capital or all these things in order to uh, for their agenda. So it's it's the World Economic Forum, the Davos crowd, Dr. Klaus, um, whatever other groups uh, people want to talk about. But those seem to be the because Davos is coming up soon. Right. So why? What's going on? I don't know. There's many layers to this onion. I'm at layer 27. I could be 20 layers away from truth. All I know is, is that, for example, in a year where they're talking about famine, for them to say that the Dutch farmers should produce 30 percent less food is surreal. I feel like I'm an MK Ultra. They just slipped me yet another hit of acid. I mean, it just doesn't make sense. It's like the only way it makes it's like That's right. the only dis- way I make. Sorry, go ahead. The only way the only way it makes sense is if you say they're doing it for some reason. It's intentional social is. intentional social engineering, but it seems like a dystopian fictional novel, like an Orwell. Uh, it's it's even these central bank digital currencies that are being advanced are more oh, Orwellian. They're well, they're more Orwellian than George Orwell could have even imagined. So interesting thing about Orwell is what was what was soothing was is that when 1984 was being read in my age bracket, it looked fictional because the technology didn't exist to do what Orwell said they'd be doing. Now it does. And so now there's a funny letter floating around the Internet where Huxley wrote to Orwell and said, loved your book. I think my model's better. It's really funny as hell. Oh, it's a real letter, supposedly. Yeah. Oh, Huxley's with the the Soma, uh, doping people up with um all those drugs. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So In brave new so, world. Yeah. You know, and then things like, for example, the opioid epidemic. You know, it's awfully convenient that they're 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 frying people by the gazillions. You know, and this this these these drugs are coming in from China, and and we're not stopping it. We could, in theory, win that war, but we're not stopping it. If we said to China, look, you stop, you stop the opioid shit or we're doing this, but no one's stopping it. And part of the problem is that since Biden is owned by China and owned by Ukraine because he's got so many corrupt dealings with them, anything Biden does that doesn't make sense, you should say, OK, who told him to do that? And then you might say, well, why would he do that? And I go, because he's owned. 
because yep. they could just de- they could destroy him. They could destroy everything that he thinks his legacy, which to me is is a hair sniffing criminal liar. But that that's a separate issue. Well, they're um, dumping they're dumping these scandals on Biden because they know he's going to be a one term president. So that's why they're trying to sweep all these scandals on him and make all the other potential candidates look clean. So that's why they're dumping the scandals on him now. That would be yeah. The other potential guess. candidates are so pathetically bad looking to me that they're just who's who's the lead candidate in your opinion? I have no idea. I mean, like if people if there was less social media, they uh the 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 kind of Justin Trudeau by looks. So like Gavin Newsom, who's like a copycat of that's Trudeau. it. That's it. Hmm? That's it. That's that looks. He looks like the lead sled dog to me. <laughs> and he he is appalling, appallingly. He, he's a source of so many bad ideas. He, he's the epitome of California's bad ideas, right? California is where all bad ideas were hatched. I grew up in California. I, I haven't been back there in 20 but, years. But Gavin Newsom has, has, has brought it to a new art form. Oh yeah, his his um lockdown policies were atrocious. I mean, the policies for small business owners were bad before that, hearing about taxes and and much and almost perpetual minimum wage hikes that the, a lot of the small business owners in California couldn't afford. But I mean, like the lockdown policies California implemented were absolutely atrocious. They caused a lot of businesses to fail. Oh, but they're talking about giving five million dollar reparations to anyone who was in jail for a drug charge. I mean, th- these are insane people. How could someone think that's a good idea? How could anyone think that's a good idea? Anybody. So so it it is as though we could the spend hours. We the spend- gaslighting model looks totally sound to me. They are attempting to drive us so nuts that we are demoralized. It is as though we're in some intellectual solitary confinement and our brain is going just Bonker saying, I just do not understand what I'm seeing. That's what happens in solitary. Very quickly, your brain turns to mush. And that's what they're doing. That's what this gaslighting is. So COVID, you know, everything looks like it's just designed to make you feel nuts. So going forward in 2023, I know it's still early in the year. Do you have any types of predictions? It doesn't have to be about markets or investing or anything like that. Any types of predictions that you're kind of confident in, whether it's like geopolitical or policy wise that you think is going to be a major theme for the rest of the year? Uh, Nothing that I'm confident in, but I'll throw out some spitballing. I think, uh, I think the Ukraine war ends and it largely ends because Putin gets what he needs. I think most of 2023 will turn out to be uh, financial problems. So I think we're going to go back to kind of an 08 model. I I think that I think by, by no stretch of the imagination was 2022 the end of our financial problems. I think it was just the beginning. So. Since we don't seem to be able to hang on to one more than one crisis at a time, my suspicion is is that that Ukraine will go away quietly the way COVID went away quietly, but it's not quite going away because we all know those liars scammed us and they they hurt a lot of people scamming us. Um, and so, uh, so I, I I think the COVID story could could fire up. I think the vaccine story could fire up. So I've probably spent at least 2,000 hours, if not more, reading about COVID and the vaccines, right? I am, I am not just aware, but I have spent huge hours reading about it over the last three years. But all through 2020, what I pointed out, I had forgotten about this, is that famous people were not dying. And you go, well, why do you care about famous people? And I said, because they're identifiable. Right. If if my, Joe Sixpack's dying in ERs, there's no way to count them. There's no way to measure it. But let's ask, what are famous people? Well, there are 535 members of Congress. There's 100 senators. There's thousands of famous athletes. There's thousands of famous politicians all over the world. So it's a very large sample side, size of people who would generate headlines if they died and they weren't dying. 
The guy sent me an email this morning and said, I remember you saying that. He says, now what's funny is famous people are dying and they're ignoring it. And I just took you off YouTube. (laughs) I don't care. You can delete this shit. You won't offend me. I understand. You got to keep your revenue stream going. I told Pop that. He actually turned it into a funny plot line by uh, by actually stepping onto the screen and saying, Dave, saying it again. We can't put this on YouTube. And now back to the show. So he made it. It's a very entertaining way Pop handled the edits. But you can just clip it. You won't offend me. I won't say, hey, what, what the hell did you do to me? Because I'm, I, I will speak freely and you edit freely. Whatever you want to do. I actually agree with a lot of what you're saying here. It's just unfortunate that we live in a society YouTube. where free speech is censored and demonetized and people get canceled. So that's why I spent 100 pages last year, not, not 2022, 2021, 100 pages writing about a rising authoritarianism. And I didn't write much about it this year because I said what I needed to say in 2021. And I don't need to say it again, but it didn't go away. It's just I had, I had, I had made my case in 2021. And when I was all done writing about it, I was so depressed. I just literally, it got uploaded. I sent no emails to friends. I post on Twitter, pinned it, and then walked from it because I was in a funk. And as a consequence, yeah, I had people email me, say, where's your year in review? And I would send it to them. And I had people say, why didn't you send it to me? And I go, I didn't send it to anybody, anybody. When I finished it, I just said, screw it. I'm done. The world's a mess. I'm moving on. But my write-up on rising authoritarianism in 2021 was kind of peak Dave, (laughs) peak Dave. Well, I also think that the food and energy crisis, and we saw hints of this in 2020 and 2021, part of 2022, I don't think it's going to go away, even though oil and natural gas prices are taking a little break. I mean, we're still seeing prices rising and problems and shrinkflation and portion sizes declining at the grocery store, the restaurant, uh, these headlines that are coming out from the food companies with their higher costs going up and their input problems and supply chain issues. It seems like the food and energy supply chains are really getting hammered compared to a lot of the other supply chains. Well, somebody said, not, see, I don't know why this would be. So I'm, I'm just going to quote what they said without professing to understand it. But someone said next year would be the big year for famine. And whether it's something like we did, whether so, so it could be, I can think of various logic. For example, if you cut back on fertilizer, you can get away with that for about a year, but then the next year you've now got tainted soil, right? It could be something like, I, I just don't know. Well, China, but, but, the Chinese government, their agricultural ministry actually admitted in 2022 that the last couple of years they've had enormous crop failure. So there was video evidence of this on YouTube and other people leaking the information about crop failures in China over the last few years, three or four years. And finally, in 2022, you had the Chinese government admit that they've had really bad crop failures. So uh, they always. Well, we to- also have a war in the, the the country that produces 40 percent of the wheat for the world. So there's that. So it's conceivable that the reason it's going to happen next year is because the war somehow didn't screw up this year, but it's going to screw up next year. It could be something like that. I, I just don't know. I mean, I'm trying to understand the world, right? This is a goofy goal. I, I read everything, anything that catches my eye, I try to understand it. And so, so, so the problem then becomes is, you know, no one has ever successfully understood the world. So why I'm trying is beyond comprehension. Uh, with that said, though, um, you know, I've also I stopped reading about what's going to happen. I've tried to stop myself from reading articles that are predictive because they often don't work. I can one time I had an exchange. I had some funny exchanges this year. I had an exchange with um, with Steve, a three way email exchange with Stephen Roach and Larry Summers. Right. Tell me how, what other chemist has that exchange. And uh, and then after that, when I had an exchange with Stephen, where he wrote an article that he said he, he made a very bad call on something. And I sent him an email. And I said, uh, I said, Stephen, I, I don't I don't have a clue what's happening in the present. 
I'm not sure I understand the past. There's no chance I can understand the future. And I said, I, I've, get, I, I, I've given up trying to understand the future. And, um, and he said, you're a wiser man than me. That was his response to that. Um, but but I, I've, given up, I've given up thinking that we understand history. This idea of history is written by the victors and therefore, right? You know, we don't get mad about the Angles and the Saxons battling away. We just know that, that somehow Anglo-Saxons were what led to us. And so we tend to think of those moments in history as good moments only because they won. Right. If China becomes the dominant culture of the world in 50 years, history will show that they were the good guys because they'll write it. And so I I don't think, you know, I can't identify a war. I, I'm a here's here's my conundrum. I'm a right wing pro choice. Uh, uh, anti war guy. What an odd combo. I can't name for you a war in the 20th century or 21st century, it was a just war for us. I don't think we should have been in World War II or I even. You can say, what about the Gulf War? I go, it turns out the Gulf War, we set up Saddam. There's actually publicly available um, um, correspondence between us and Saddam's in which one of our State Department people said, your your what you your relationships with Kuwait are not of interest to the United States. We set him up to invade. Well, I think we also set him up to take over their government too. Decades before that, I mean, I I believe he was oh yes he was funded and trained by us, just like Osama bin Laden was. So the U.S. foreign policy, the military industrial complex, the deep state, with um with our intelligence agencies having just so much power and control to replace other governments. And uh, uh, that's why uh, JFK wanted the CIA disbanded. <laughs> right. We know how that worked out. Um, by the way, I just finished a book called Poisoner in Chief. The shit the CIA was doing in the 50s and 60s was truly unbelievably bad stuff. Is there reason to believe they've stopped? Good question. Um so uh, so that's where we're at. It's kind of a strange world that we live in now, right? Yeah, there's a lot of mis... Just because there's all this information available on the internet, it's information overload and a lot of it's misinformation spin. I think you brought up an interesting point there with history. I, that was one of my majors, undergraduate in college. I mean, there's a lot of subjective bias in college textbooks for history. So there's always the other side of what actually might have happened. A lot of the stuff of details of battles or, or who actually won. I mean... There was tons of lies and spin in the history books that's not accurately accounted for because I guess the victors uh, ended up writing the story. So a lot of it's just very subjective. Right. And, uh, right. you know, a general level, a general level uh, college history book even is not going to tell both sides of a story. So. Right. Right. Well, David, I really enjoyed our discussion today. Again, this was not about investing in markets. 2022 was a crazy year with inflation, asset price volatility, the pace of the Fed rate hikes. I don't think the effect of the rate hikes has priced itself into everything yet. I think we're still probably looking, I don't know, timing on this at a real estate crash, especially if the Fed keeps hiking rates. And there's going to be a, a government debt crisis. I don't know which countries are going to be first. It looks like maybe Japan finally after 30 something years and emerging markets. But we'll have to see. And the U.S. may be safe for last. But that's just going to give the uh, parasites here, the rent seeking parasites here in D.C. from both political parties an excuse to keep spending more before the um, before Rome is on fire and the fat lady sings. Well, here's the funny thing. I also think. That you know, there is a relationship between the Fed and the the government. And historically, Feds have said we need more fiscal help, right? So they've kind of blamed the government for not helping bail out the system. And I think now that's flipped. And now I think Powell's staring at the government, going, "No matter what I do, those boneheads are going to do these crazy ass inflationary things." So I think, and Powell. 
Do you think Paul has any allegiance or obligation to Biden? I have no How idea Paul? why he even still wants to have that job. I mean, I wouldn't want to be the bag holder. I would want to be out. I would want to yeah. get, go get my six or seven figure consulting j- job or retire or wait a well, couple He's years. already rich, so he doesn't need it. He, he's already wealthy, so he didn't he didn't need the revolving door. Well, plus he's not going to go to prison for front running the QE purchases in 2020. He bought, I think, over five million dollars worth of municipal bonds. You know the, the backstory of that? Do you know the backstory of that? It turns out, so I'm down in New Orleans in a meeting, and Danielle DiMartino Booth is running a little late to show up for dinner with about eight of us, and she sits at the table, and she's at a high vibrational level, even for Danielle standards, which is already a high vibrational level. She had just got off the phone with, I will guess with great confidence, but she didn't say Richard Fisher. And what had happened in that whole bond trading thing is that um, Lyle Brainerd was pissed off when she didn't get the big gig at the Fed. And then she got super pissed off when she didn't get the job at Treasury and they gave it to Yellen. So Lyle Brainerd uh, threw several of the potential Fed candidates in front of her under the bus by telling, I think it was the Financial Times, that they were day trading. Those are the guys who ended up leaving the Fed because of it. They were day trading their actions. Now, what happened was the Financial Times flipped on Brainerd and said, um, said, well, but you signed their conflict of interest statements. Why are you not guilty? And Brainerd, to get herself off that hook, said, I will give you an even bigger fish. The Financial Times said, OK. And she tried to throw Powell under the bus. That's the story. That's the backstory right there. That type of corruption happens all the time. see, there's lot of yeah but of, that drama was interesting drama because that was fresh off that was fresh off the grill a that, lot of she go ahead sorry well she had just come down from the phone call with fisher if it was fisher i'm just guessing but since since danielle and fisher joined at the hip for years if she's got a mole in, in the system it's it's richard fisher yeah, a, a lot of times these scandals, the the information, the media here in New York, in the D.C. area or New York City gets leaked the stuff by a government employee. And it's like an unnamed source, but it's someone who got in trouble and they handed a bigger piece of information implicating someone else above them. So this this stuff happens all the time. But I mean, a lot of these people are taking bribes and other it's just. I mean, Stevie Cohen bought the Mets and he was trading on inside. He had FDA employees on his payroll for years. Yeah, I know. I know. The hedge fund guys certainly get great inside information. Yeah, he did. I, I think, I think, I think Stevie's fine. probably a fine. Oh, 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 break my heart. Um, they never got Corzine. They could have gotten Corzine. They didn't. No one, no one ever goes to jail. Don't ever go to jail. Here's a question I like to ask. Totally off topic, but I like to ask anyways. We hear how child trafficking is a huge problem, right? Right? Am I correct about that? Yeah. Child trafficking. When was the last time you heard of... Now, these children are not being trafficked into trailer parks and being bought for $100 bills. These are expensive kids. When was the last time someone of prominence, someone we know, anybody for that matter, was arrested for being the recipient of one of those children? When was the last time? I can't remember, honestly. I can't either. Where you might find a yes was Denny Hastert, who did a little jail time. But then the question there becomes, okay, who who did he piss off inside the government? Well, Bernie, Bernie Frank, I think, went on C-SPAN 20-something years ago. It was actually on live TV, and he threatened all the people in Congress because his boyfriend – had gotten busted for running a prostitution ring out of his uh with underage prostitutes too out of his dc uh brownstone a brothel and he said if i go down i'm taking the other people who are at the parties with me right and so he didn't get taken down they never do when clinton was being chased around because he he pardoned mark rich 
who's a financier running around Europe, never came back for trial, blah, 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 blah. And the Republicans just had a field day with Mark Rich. What they didn't mention was that Clinton had pardoned 1,115 or some odd people by the time he was done that was pretty much all money laundering and drugs. The whole, his entire list of pardons. These are not soccer moms who got in jail for something stupid. Well, yeah, look up Nina, Arkansas, and the Cl- Clinton right. was governor. Clinton was governor the Clinton, there. The Clinton Chronicle. So Clinton had pardoned a guy who was, who was, who was caught for trafficking 800 kilos of cocaine. Now, here's the problem. The fact that Clinton did that, that doesn't shock me. What's disturbing is the Republicans had to know all this, too, and they didn't touch it, which means, therefore, the rule inside the beltway is make all the snarly noises you want and thump your chest, do whatever you want, but you never, ever draw blood. Jesse Ventura said it best. Do you remember his quote? He said it's basically like professional wrestling with both political parties. So he said they go on live TV and they hit each other over the head with chairs. And then he's like, afterwards, they're drinking beers and going to parties and acting like none of that ever happened. And that's why they have rules of order in Congress where you don't you don't insult other you don't make insulting statements to other Congress and senators, congressmen and senators, because they it, where it got where it got really perverted was when when C-SPAN showed up, when we went from behind closed doors where people of power could somehow solve some problems. I know this sounds so weird to to everything being done by a live microphone. Things went to shit fast. So so now it's not about who can bring something back to their district that makes them electable. It's about who can get to the microphone. And and that's how you end up with candidates like Beto and and various crazy people who just should not be near, near political office. Are you talking Beto O'Rourke? I mean, his his wife is a billionaire heiress, so so she's funding everything. I mean, she's paying for his image. She's paying for the marketing consultants. She's paying the mainstream media for TV time. I mean, she's the one who's funding all this stuff. Right. And the system's a goner. I don't know. It, it just end of empire to me. I, I just, I can't. Oh yeah, I agree. The, the behavior this, this from- could be, this could be the bottom, right? To use an economic logic when things are, uh, uh, the, the views are always best from the top and, and darkest from the bottom. So maybe this well, is the bottom. Well, the, the stuff that's occurring with both political parties now here in the D.C. metro area is very similar, although technology although technology is a lot better, obviously. But human nature doesn't really change that much, even though technology has changed. I mean, it's reminding me of reading about behavior in the Roman Senate. The corruption. Here's what the- has changed is over time, since the turn of the century, the government went from something like 3% of GDP to 50% of GDP or whatever the magic number is. So now, now government largesse is just unimaginably large compared to any other period in history. And that's the corruption right there. So now if you're a major corporation, you must be getting paid by the government to stay afloat. And you're you're a scientist, so you understand entropy. So that's wait what wasted energy. So all of this waste, fraud, corruption, and abuse, it took decades upon decades and then compounding. And finally, we're at these levels now where interest payments on the national debt, if the Fed keeps hiking interest rates for 2023, we're looking at a trillion dollars per year just in interest payments, not counting any of the other spending that both political parties, the crazy ones in both political parties want to do. And no one here, there's maybe a couple people in either party, want to actually talk about reducing spending. They all have their uh, spending projects and then they're willing to trade votes in whatever the 1.7 trillion omnibus bill. So there's tons of stuff in each bill that has nothing to do with the bill because everyone's been trading votes for their project and spending bills back and forth, back and forth. Right. And this is why it's stage four cancer, because we really are past the fail safe point. We, we now can't we can't fight inflation. We can't pay off our debt. People say, oh, you're never supposed to pay off your debt. Well, well, when your debt's running out ahead of GDP, you are on, you are on a death spiral. 
It's a debt Ponzi. Debt. It keeps great. Yeah, it's a Ponzi scheme, basically. It's it's a complete so so the bottom line is is that and and people just can't imagine it. I go, that doesn't mean it won't happen. Just because you can't imagine it doesn't mean it won't happen. You know, I like to draw an analogy where you know, say, well, you know, you're warned of this and it's not gonna happen. Well, you know, in the mid-30s, there had to have been, there had to have been Jewish families sitting around the dining room table talking about risk. And I know it's hard to get out of Germany, but there's some who had to have decided that it would blow over and it didn't. There are times in history where it doesn't blow over, whether it's the Cultural Revolution, whether it's the French Revolution. There's times where people really lose their shit. Well, uh, Neil Howe, who's actually local here in the D.C. metro area, I've had lunch with him half a dozen times. He would say a generational cycle and an 80 year cycle, and it's basically a fourth turning. So we're heading into that. Well, he he called that one brilliantly back in 1996 when he said it was going to show up around 2010. That's pretty close. That's a pretty good call, in my opinion. Well, David, so. I've kept you, I've kept you for an over an hour. I'm going to attach a link to your full report. It's what over on Chris Martinson's website. Still, if you want, if our listeners want to read the entire thing, it's my pin tweet. It's my pin tweet. Okay, and I will attach a link to your Twitter and also to the full report if the listeners want to click a link on the and, report and send me a link. Send me an email with a link in it. I appreciate it. Thank you again for your time. And I always enjoy our discussions. I wish things were happier. Is there anything you're actually optimistic about? Let me think about it. I didn't play golf this last summer. I'm going to play golf again next summer. I, I took it up after about 40 years the previous summer. And I haven't lost this since on my drive. I, I was a long ball hitter and I still kind of have it, but um, I was making progress. And then last year when I started to play golf, it's like I'd given it all back. So the winter just wiped out all games and, and I ate probably the vaccine. Who knows? Um, I'm going to take it up again this spring and, and become obsessive compulsive over golf again. When I was a kid, I was a good golfer. Not a great golfer, but a good golfer. I'll tell you what I'm optimistic about. People are starting to, instead of these Silicon Valley revenue only companies that just grow revenue, don't focus on fundamentals, don't focus on profit margins or free cash flow, invent their own accounting metrics, get away for years with accounting fraud. People are starting to actually look at fundamentals again. People are starting to look at risk again, managing risk. People are saying, I need some cash. I need some gold. You know, the the normal historical views of protecting yourself, defensive measures, looking at risk, and people are finally starting to talk about supply side problems for these commodities that, oh, hey, we have these ESG policies, but we don't have enough copper. We don't have enough oil or natural gas or other energy. We need to actually think about allowing some investment. So I know it's kind of a minority opinion for right now, but people are actually starting to talk about, it's not just Chris Martinson anymore with the uh, crash course or a small other percentage of people, but more people are starting to talk about, maybe it's Doomberg who's doing a lot of the awareness raising because his, uh, his their influence is so large that there needs to be more emphasis on the supply side to fix future problems going forward. I, I know who Doomberg is. He is a an impressive character in his previous existence. I, I know. Don't one say of, it if you know. Don't yeah, say it I, if you know. Well, I'm not going to say. I'm not going to say it because I was told not to say it. I know one of the people at Doomberg. It's actually it's a team of people. I know one of them. Yeah, well, I know where Doomberg came from. <laughs> Makes fun of Bloomberg, probably. <laughs> no, the name, but I know the guy. Oh, I thought it was a team. That's what I was told, anyway. No, no, Doomberg. No, it was start. Well, he has a team because it's a pretty big operation now. But Doomberg, the guy, the guy who started it, is was a prominent character. Yeah, let's not name names because I was given permission. So, <laughs> right. just like so, it, just so like go. I. What, well, what's funny, Dave, is I actually know one of the first uh, couple of people who was involved in Zero Hedge when it was just a blog. And so like now it's it's owned by different people. But when it first started, it was actually a group of disgruntled CNBC and Bloomberg News uh, producers who had their stories. Well, there's, there's some Eastern European connections there, too. 
Well, now, yeah, it was bought later. It started off as just a blog with people that were releasing stories that were killed by the higher ups at CNBC about the housing market. I, I still the- think it's a it's a it's a place where a lot of people leak key stuff. I, I still think it's 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 kind of it's got a certain WikiLeaks quality about it. Still, I think I I think it's the place you go when you got to get a story out anonymously. Yeah, but I, you don't get the you don't get the coverage you get at Zero Hedge. You want to yeah, get a story out, you go to Zero Hedge. Yeah, for for now. Yeah, I mean what Zero they, Hedge they is right want- in terms of coverage is right up there with CBS. It's that big now. In terms there's, of actual visibility, Zero Hedge is there's a list of of various outlets. Zero Hedge is right next, right, and I don't know where it is now, but as of a couple of months ago, it was right next to CBS on the list. Yeah, their traffic is really large. They have too many weird ads on there for my liking. I mean, I have ad blocker, but the funny thing is like, I think they changed the policy, but I remember years ago when within the, for the first few years when Zero Hedge started, the large banks had a policy that if they caught you on a phone call or an email leaking to Zero Hedge, you're immediately fired. <laughs> there was no there was no argument about why you were emailing them or calling them that you were immediately fired. <laughs> right. Well, you know, um, it's the place to leak, right? It is the place to leak. So well, and that's um, because the journal the journalists, and I'm using air quotes, aren't doing their job. So yes, uh, the truth will find a, its way eventually. <laughs> <laughs> right. The other funny thing is when Enron went south, someone went through the Yahoo chat boards. Remember those? They don't exist anymore, pretty much. But maybe they do. I don't know. But I haven't seen one in years. But but they went through the Enron chat board and the whole story was there. The whole Enron disaster was on the chat board. There were insiders dropping truth bombs. It doesn't surprise I, me because, I mean, there's stuff like that on Reddit and 4chan now. But you don't know how reliable the information is until later, years later. Right. So in any event, it was fun. Send me stuff and I'll post it on my Twitter feed. I really appreciate it, David. I think this was very thought provoking. So I may have to edit out some of the stuff here so I don't have my YouTube channel totally removed. Unfortunately, that's yeah. the I do not want to be the guy who causes you to lose your revenue stream. Yeah, especially because I've probably basically been blacklisted from normal financial industry jobs. Okay, David. So thank you again for your time. I appreciate it. Adiós.